Greetings, folks, and welcome to another edition of History Up Close, sponsored by the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation and brought to you by Hellcat Productions. We're really, really excited about today's topic as we get to talk about the Marlin, the Navy's last flying boat that you see uh, behind me here in Hangar Bay 1. And today, to tell you that great story, we have helicopter pilot extraordinaire Kim Sheldon, who flew helicopters in his time in the Navy, but his father, flew this very type of airplane during his time in naval service. Kim, take it away. Thank you, Captain Gilliam. The flying boat you see over my right shoulder here is the last of a breed of Navy seaplanes that formed the backbone of long-range patrol and anti-submarine warfare for more than 50 years from the time naval aviation started in 1911. When we think of naval aviation, we generally think of aircraft carriers, supersonic jets, and multi-role helicopters. But the fact is that for the first 10, or the first 10 years of naval aviation, starting in 1911, nine out of 10 of the aircraft in the Navy's inventory were actually seaplanes. Good morning, my name's Lieutenant Commander Kim Sheldon, U.S. Navy retired, and I'm pleased to be your host this morning at your National, National Museum of Naval Aviation here in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, this is the world's largest collection of naval and maritime aircraft, and it's also unique in having both the first and the last of the Navy's seaplanes. But for the sake of uh, full disclosure, uh, I have a very sentimental attachment to this airplane. Uh, back in the early 1960s, my father flew this plane, and uh, I was, a, as an energetic and, and curious 10-year-old, I was afforded many opportunities to go down to the flight line with him on non-flying days when he was working at the squadron and actually got to crawl through these airplanes. It was a very awesome experience for a 10-year-old. The airplane seemed extremely huge to me then, and even today, looking back, it's, it's still a pretty big airplane. But that experience inspired me uh, towards an interest in naval aviation. And the other thing that makes uh, its location here in the museum uh, particularly meaningful to me is that right opposite the uh, P-5 Marlin that we're looking at, is the aircraft I've spent most of my naval aviation career flying in the Marine Corps and the Navy, the Boeing Vertol CH-46 Sea Knight. People might ask, what is a seaplane? Uh, the intuitive answer, of course, is that any aircraft that is designed to operate, take off and land and operate from the water, could be classified as a seaplane. But seaplanes are kind of a general overall uh, category of airplanes, and they can be subdivided generally into three major components or three major uh, types. Now the first type are float planes. These are airplanes that are frequently start out as land planes, had their landing gear substituted with a one or two floats or pontoons, which enable it to operate from the water. In fact, the Navy's very first airplane in 1911 built by Glenn Curtis was the A-1 Triad, which had both a float and a land plane configuration depending on what they desired to use it for. The uh, second type of seaplane is the flying boat. Now what makes flying boats uh, unique is that their entire fuselage is designed like a boat with a watertight hull having a, a keel and these airplanes are designed to, to operate strictly from the water. You'll notice on our P-5 back here you see two big landing gear, one uh, red on the left side and green on the right side. These are called beaching gear and when the airplane was normally stored on land it was then taken by a tractor down a ramp and with its engines running and it was eased in the water. Ground crew wearing hip waders would get in the water and detach these beaching gear from the airplane and then it could taxi off towards the uh, aerodrome to, or the, hydro, the, um, the water runway to take off from. Seaplanes are, are really a hybrid and these are called amphibians. Amphibians are really nothing more than uh, seaplanes, either float plane variety or the, or the flying boat variety that have been designed to have integral retractable landing gear enabling them to land uh, on a, a hard surface, uh, land runway, or the water, either one. So uh, these aircraft can fr frequently beach themselves without the need for uh, a large beaching crew, and it's a much more versatile type of uh, seaplane, whether it's a float plane or a flying boat in configuration. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the first airplane the Navy obtained in 1911 was the Curtis A-1 Triad. Uh, the, this set the, the tone for naval aviation for the next 10 years, uh, where most of the airplanes were float planes, and typically their first employment was as aerial scouts for the cruisers and battleships of the fleet, of the main battle line. They would be uh, launched from catapult and then recovered after they'd performed their mission and craned back on board. Uh, the Navy, though, started looking for 
uh, more uh, uh, advanced designs with longer range and greater speed. And this is when they started turning to companies like Consolidated, Curtis, Douglas, Sikorsky, and the Glenn Martin Company of Baltimore, Maryland for flying boats, multi-engine flying boats that would provide much greater speed, range, and safety in flight. Much of the impetus for this, of course, was World War I, starting in 1914, which the, Navy, the uh, United States entered in 1917, uh, and the German U-boat or submarine threat. Now, the U-boats of the period uh, were not, could not dive very deeply, uh, so they could often be spotted uh, visually from the air even while they were submerged. And the Navy uh, obtained a number of flying boat designs designed for that express purpose for anti-submarine warfare or ASW. Uh, the Navy Curtis or NC Nancy boats were a design that was intended for that. And in fact, the NC-4 uh, an airplane, which is also here in our museum, was the first aircraft ever to cross the Atlantic in May of 1919. Uh, seaplane development through the 1920s and 1930s advanced rapidly uh, and with bigger and faster, more longer ranging uh, flying boats, enabling uh, companies like Pan American Airways, for example, under the leadership of Juan Tripp, to develop the first transoceanic civilian air airline routes. But they were also important to the Navy because during this time, before the advent of radar and things like satellite surveillance, only long range flying boat patrol aircraft could give the kind of early warning or detection of any threats that were approaching the country by sea. Now with the advent of World War II, uh, flying boats like the famous consolidated PBY Catalina and Martin's PBM Mariner uh, flew a variety of roles in support of our war effort on two oceans against the Germans and the Japanese. Uh, of course, the PBY Catalina is most famous for being the first aircraft to spot the approaching Japanese fleet. Uh, in June of 1942 when they're, in their attempt to seize Midway Island. Uh, you may also remember that later in the war, a PBY Catalina was the airplane that saved the first uh, group of survivors from the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Uh, there were other missions they flew. Uh, of course, long-range patrol is their uh, bread and butter, but they also uh, engaged, especially in the Battle of the Atlantic with uh, German U-boats and uh, in the South Pacific, Navy Black Cat squadrons uh, used their Catalinas painted black to go in at night and uh, attack an, uh, enemy shipping. Uh, again, to come back to rescue, Air Sea Rescue was a very important uh, mission for all the flying boats in World War II. And uh, this was uh, Air Sea Rescue especially important. Uh, the nickname they acquired was Dumbo. Uh, and this became, uh, continued to be an important mission for flying boats uh, even past World War II. After World War II, the Navy wanted to upgrade its flying boat fleet and approached the Glenn Martin Company and asked them for an advanced design based on the wartime PBM Mariner. Uh, in 1948, Marlin produced the P-5M, then called the P-5M, is now called the, P, the SP-5B. But the P-5M-1 first flew in 1948, and by 1951, the Navy was equipping its first, or most of its uh, seaplane squadrons with the P-5M. Now, the P-5M was innovative in many ways. It was really ahead of its time in many ways. The first thing that's more important to note, to note about its design was that uh, based on design data we obtained from captured German Blomen Voss BV-222 Viking uh, flying boats, uh, the Marlin incorporated an 8.5 uh, to 1 length to beam ratio in its hull. It was discovered uh, that the, length, the lengthier fuselage uh, was both more aeronomic, aerodynamically uh, efficient, but it also uh, eliminated the tendency to porpoise uh, that airplanes like the Catalina and the Mariner had suffered because of their shorter 6.5 to 1 length to beam ratio. So this was an important innovation. It made the Marlin both faster in the air and also able to operate more safely in higher sea states than its predecessors did. Another innovation of the Marlin, if you'll follow me, I'm going to go back and show it to you. It is something called the hydro flap. It's difficult to see right now because it's in the closed position, but the hydro flaps were a pair of flaps that were uh, built into the lower surface of the uh, aft hull on the, on the Marlin. And these uh, served to operate together when the airplane landed, the pilots could use their toe brakes on their rudder pedals to uh, actuate the hydro flaps, which would break the airplane 
uh, cause it to break and slow down more rapidly. They could also use them differentially, one at a time, to serve as water rudders, which made the airplane extremely maneuverable on the water, much more so than other seaplanes. Coupled with the reversible pitch uh, Curtis electric uh, propellers, which was another innovation, the airplane could basically pivot uh, in one position, which was unheard of in, in seaplanes at that time. So a great number of uh, big innovations right there with the P-5 that were ahead of its time. As we move forward here while I'm talking, while we're back here in this part of the airplane, what you see attached to the uh, midship's uh, crew door here is a JATO bottle, Jet Assisted Takeoff. There's uh, actually room for two of them there. One's mounted on this side and one's on the other, but they could mount a total of four. And uh, what they would use these for is that in particularly rough sea states, once the airplane was up to flying speed, was on what they call the step, and ready to become airborne, they, the pilot could uh, fire these JATO bottles and really leap off the, off the water more rapidly. And it was very useful in, in high sea states where it was getting difficult to uh, come unglued from the water. And we'll move back forward to the aft part of the uh, starboard wing here. Uh, this is a feature that the Marlin shared with the Mariner of World War II. Uh, rather than having an opening for a bomb bay in the hull, which you didn't want, but you wanted to maintain the watertight integrity of your hull, they built the bomb bays into the nacelles of each of the engines. So you had your, your right cyclone engines up uh, front, but you had these bomb bays here, which could house a variety of uh, ASW weapons, from acoustic torpedoes to depth charges to conventional bombs. Uh, also, on the underside of each wing, port and starboard, you had hard points for up to eight uh, five inch high velocity aerial rockets or other conventional ordnance could be used against surface uh, submarines or other uh, shipboard targets. On the far end of the starboard wing here, you see a little pod uh, just below the, uh, the landing light. And this houses a 70 million candle power carbon arc searchlight. It was controlled by a little joystick in the co-pilot's uh, side of the cockpit. And uh, when an airplane came in to uh, prosecute a uh, surfaced a submarine, they could turn on that, uh, can that uh, carbon arc searchlight, turn night into day, and, uh, and then use that as a visual for uh, pr prosecuting their attack, or, or in the case of Russian submarines, just taking their picture. We'll move for further forward here. The uh, Marlin featured, the Marlin featured a single step, uh, Com uh, combination deep V uh, planing hull, which gave it real good stability at slow speeds and, and rough seas, but also with the planing part of the hull, uh, gave it the ability to get up on, on the plane, get up on the step uh, much more rapidly than the, the preceding uh, seaplanes of that era. And we'll move back, back forward. Some more features of the airplane. This huge gull wing which again was a carryover from the PBM Mariner. The gull wing was shoulder mounted to the fuselage, uh, which enabled them to get the engines uh, well enough up off the water where they had to worry about taking sea spray into the engines. But the, uh, the gull wing here mounted two uh, pr uh, right, Curtis Wright R3350 um, turbo compound radial engines. Now these were turbo compound engines. What that meant was there was, a, was something they called a power recovery turbine, which took exhaust gas, recycled, ran this turbine, and then supercharged the fuel air mixture back to the uh, engine cylinders, which gave increased uh, horsepower output. Each one of these engines produced 3,450 horsepower, which enabled the Marlin to achieve a maximum speed in flight of 269 miles per hour and a range of 3,000 miles. If you look up at the top of the vertical fin here, this is the P5M2. This was the second model that, uh, Mar that Martin built of the Marlin. The first model was the P5M1, which was distinguished by its more conventional tail layout. The uh, horizontal uh, fin or tail, tailplane, was actually mounted, as on most airplanes, at the base of the vertical fin right on top of the fuselage. Uh, what they did with the P5M2 was they moved th that uh, horizontal tail up to the top of the rudder. This did two things. It, gave, it got the elevators out of the salt spray, out of the sea spray on takeoff, and it also gave the aircraft better pitch control. Uh, so the P5M2 came online and was started uh, uh, being developed to, uh, delivered to Navy squadrons by 1954. See the stinger out here behind the, the uh, horizontal tail up there. This is called 
the MAD boom, MAD or magnetic anomaly detector, and I'll talk about that more in more detail in, in just a little bit. Okay, we'll go back to the front. Marlin was manned by a crew of 10 to 12, and as always with seaplanes, uh, seaplane crews had to be not only uh, capable aviators, but they also had to be competent seamen as well. They had to have the skill of being able to judge a wind and wave, set and drift, being able to handle things like sea anchors and lines, small boats, etc. So it was much more to being a seaplane uh, crewman than just being a good aviator. Uh, a squadron of a dozen P-5s supported by a seaplane tender could be based virtually anywhere in the world wherever a, a protected anchorage could be found, whether that was a bay, a harbor, uh, a coral atoll lagoon as down in the South Pacific or in the case of bays and harbors up in the Aleutians uh, during World War II. Uh, so this kind of uh, operational flexibility, uh, the Navy re valued very much. And even though the aircraft carrier had come along and come into its own by the end of World War II, uh, the Navy's seaplane fleet still offered them great flexibility uh, for basing uh, overseas where you didn't need to have a big runway or big shore establishment uh, to uh, base your airplanes. Now, at the end of World War II, the Navy faced a new and very dangerous threat. Uh, as I mentioned before, the German U-boat threat in the Battle of the Atlantic uh, was a very close run, run thing. In fact, by late 1942-1943, the Germans were very almost uh, close to establishing a torpedo curtain across the Atlantic until new technology like sonar and, um, and sauna buoys and, and advanced uh, homing torpedoes and everything started to turn the tide uh, along with long-range uh, seaplanes and uh, small baby flat tops with anti-submarine warfare uh, air wings. But what the Navy found was that the Germans, at, right towards the end of the war, were developing and had actually fleeted a new class of submarine called the, the Type 21 submarine. This was a uh, ultra-quiet, very fast, very efficient submarine that was almost as fast underwater as it was on the surface. And uh, another innovation the Germans uh, put into the Type 21 was something called a snorkel. Ordinarily, submarines had to run for hours and hours on the surface, usually at night, to recharge their batteries because they had to run on batteries once they were submerged. With a snorkel, however, a diesel electric submarine could run submerged with the snorkel up and still run on its diesel engines while recharging their batteries. Now, the Soviet Union captured a number of these submarines, as we did at the end of the war, but the Russians were very quick to incorporate this, these German, advanced German des submarine designs into their own new fleet of submarines. And this was a challenge now the Navy had to face uh, at the end of World War II. Uh, therefore, the P-5M was optimized for anti-submarine warfare. And we'll talk about some of the features that it had. You'll notice one of the most distinctive things about the Marlin is this bulbous nose radome on it. This nose radome housed a very powerful surface search radar that had a seven foot diameter parabolic dish antenna. This, this radar was very long range and could detect something as small as a periscope or a snorkel, if not the submarine itself, from a long range away. Uh, and I can't see, I don't know if you can see it from here, but there's also another radome on top of the fuselage just behind the cockpit. This was an electronic countermeasures uh, antenna that was designed to home in on uh, high frequency radio uh, 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 signals. So it's called HFDF or high frequency direction finding or huff duff. Uh, with the information uh, gleaned from that, you know, detecting emissions and triangulating the position of it, the airplane could then use its radar to try to get closer to the contact. Uh, once they were in the area where suspected contact was used, the, the uh, other part of the uh, airplane's ASW suite was something called a sauna buoy. And this was developed in World War II and refined uh, a lot after the war. Uh, in fact, the ones we use today are very, very refined. Uh, but the ones we were using in the 1950s and 60s with the Marlin uh, and its land-based counterparts were about three inches in diameter and about, I'm sorry, four inches in diameter, about three feet long. And this was a buoy that was dropped by in the air, descended to the surface of the water by parachute, and had a radio antenna, a radio transmitter in the upper end, and a sonar transducer on the bottom on a long spool of wire. When the buoy hit the water, this uh, hydrophone would drop to a preset depth and begin listening for the low frequency sounds of a submarine. Whatever it heard would then be transmitted by radio back to the P5 where a sensor operator could evaluate the, the contact. Now by using pairs of these sauna buoys dropped in a particular pattern, the P5 crew could triangulate the rough position of a suspected submarine. Once they had that rough position established, 
They would then fly a clover leaf uh, pattern, and then this is where the MAD stinger in the, in the uh, back of the airplane uh, comes in. MAD stands for Magnetic Anomaly Detector. And what this does is detects large metallic objects, say like a submerged submarine, uh, and it gives an indication on a scope when you pass uh, close to it or over it. And so this uh, P5 would then go through a clover leaf search pattern until the MAD operator in the crew saw a blip on his screen. He would then uh, announce to the crew over the intercom, MAD, 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 and they would drop a retro uh, rocket smoke float that would drop to the surface of water and mark the, the site of the suspected submarine visually. The airplane could then go into an attack pattern to either drop a homing torpedo or uh, depth charges or simply prosecute and, and uh, follow the uh, contact more closely in the case of a non-shooting uh, environment. Thanks in part to its great sea keeping uh, abilities, the U.S. Coast Guard took an interest in the P-5 as well and obtained uh, about six P-5M1s and four uh, P-5M2s for use exclusively as search and rescue aircraft. The French Navy's Aero Naval also obtained uh, 10 of P-5M2s uh, for use, and they used those for about eight years or so. The saltwater environment imposed heavy uh, pun uh, penalties on seaplane operations due to uh, corrosion and popped rivets. And by the late 1950s, early 1960s, the use of seaplanes was rapidly falling out of favor with the Navy, especially in light of the fact that more capable and equally long-range land-based airplanes like Lockheed's P-2V Neptune and P-3A Orion were becoming more and more available and able to take the load. So uh, the writing was on the wall that the seaplanes days were numbered in the Navy. Uh, by 1962, when the airplane had been renamed, redesignated the SP-5B, and by 1965, uh, the number of Marlins in squadron service had dwindled to only three squadrons. The last of these squadrons made its last deployment to South Vietnam in 1967 in support of Operation Market Garden. After their deployment was over, all the airplanes were flown from Kanran Bay in South Vietnam to Japan uh, for uh, decommissioning and the scrapper's torch. All airplanes except one. Bureau number 135533 was flown all the way back to San Diego, uh, where the Navy had, a, had acquired its very first seaplane in 1911. And after an appropriate ceremony, it was flown all the way back to Naval Air Station Patuxent River, Maryland for preservation and donation to the Smithsonian Institution. Fast forward to 1977, and the, the uh, P-5, this airplane, 135533, was barged down to Naval Air Station Pensacola for uh, uh, restoration and inclusion in the new Na Naval Aviation Museum site here at Sherman Field, where it's remained since then to this day uh, on permanent loan from the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, the seaplanes uh, are in a bygone era. Uh, the museum here is, is fortunate to have the sole remaining survivor of that breed of uh, seaplane. Uh, out of 238 uh, SP-5B Marlins that were produced, only one still exists today, and that's right here at, at the museum in Pensacola. While overtaken and replaced by more capable land and carrier-based aircraft, the seaplane remains a formative and um, important part of naval aviation history. And Bureau number 135533 here is the sole survivor of 238 aircraft produced, uh, is indeed a unique and a valuable uh, addition to the museum's uh, collection. Uh, and right now, that'll be the end of my, for my presentation, but I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have about the P-5. Thank you so much, Kim. That was such an amazing, impressive explanation of this aircraft. Um, everyone, we apologize for the technical difficulties and we appreciate you sticking with us. We've got some questions for you. Okay, the first one comes from Rick. He says, word has it, the lift crew dropped the plane during transport, damaging the keel. Is there any truth to that? I personally don't know. That's something might be that uh, our uh, foundation uh, museum uh, historian Hill Goodspeed might be able to answer. Uh, looking at the airplane numerous times myself, I don't see any sign of existing damage now. So uh, it was barged. Uh, they'd taken the outer wing panels off the airplane uh, at Pax River, uh, put it on a barge and brought it down through the intercoastal waterway to Pensacola in 1975, uh, and then offloaded it down at uh, where present day uh, Schools Command is and it sat there for a couple of years before they finally got it restored and put on display here in the museum in 1977 but i don't know for a fact that that happened so this next question kind of dovetails into that and it comes from john he says was this 
part of the museum built around this plane, and he's referencing uh, Hangar Bay 1 here. Uh, I'm not sure. You know, the, the original plan for the museum was to repeat the, uh, the, the design uh, uh, philosophy of um, Paul Chen, who had designed the original octagonal uh, building design, and they were all going to be you know, joined together as they got more money and, and made uh, additional add-ons to the museum. Hangar Bay 1, I'm not sure what the uh, design philosophy, why the change came, but it was, uh, it was fortuitous that they did get uh, something big enough to put the P-5 in, because sitting out in, uh, in the elements, uh, here in this salt air environment in Pensacola, Florida, is, is uh, the ultimately destructive uh, environment to be in. Matter of fact, I interviewed the original director of the museum, Captain uh, Grover Walker, uh, back about 25 years ago, and he said it was never a question of winning the battle against the elements. He says it was a question of how, how long we could delay uh, the, the inevitable result, which, and this airplane was looking pretty, pretty uh, bad from time to time uh, sitting outside, so it was uh, real uh, miraculous we got it inside a building finally. So our next question comes from Mike, and he says, can you tell me about the Julie slash Jezebel Sonoboy system? Sure, yeah, Jezebel and Julie were, were two complementary systems that were early uh, ASW development after World War II. Uh, Jezebel was a system that worked in concert with, uh, the Navy had uh, planted an uh, array of uh, sonar uh, listening devices across the world's oceans. It was called SOSIS. Uh, and these, uh, these bottom-mounted hydrophones could pick up low-frequency sounds and triangulate to within a certain, uh, you know, uh, defined area, uh, enough to, to get a patrol plane out on, on site. And the Jezebel system would use the airplane's own sensors and sauna buoys uh, to, uh, to further localize or eliminate the ambiguity uh, with regards to what exactly where is this submarine. Uh, Julie was an add-on to this. What they did with the early sauna buoys didn't have active uh, pingers. They didn't actually send out an active ping. They, they do today, but they didn't then. So what they did was they used something called a small practice depth charge, and they would drop this depth charge near one of the sauna boy uh, patterns, and it would send out the sound, and then all the sauna boys would listen for the echo from that small uh, sound. Uh, the, the reason they named it Julie was because I th the, the, the tale goes that there was a, a famous burlesque dancer in New York. Uh, one of the engineers said that, you know, uh, she could get, uh, get the attention of, of people, so th they decided to name this, this depth, small depth practice depth charge uh, Julie in her honor. So were any of these uh, attached to the plane or were located on the plane? The sauna boys? The sauna buoys were carried inside the aircraft, and I, you may have seen it when I was doing a walk around in the aircraft. There were a couple external chutes on each side of the airplane. The, the uh, sonar tech in the airplane would prepare a, a sauna buoy uh, and put it into the chute, and then when the pilot uh, or the TACO, the tactical action officer, uh, told them, they would uh, deploy those sauna buoys uh, from the airplane. Same, same systems used today on the, uh, the former P-3 uh, uh, Orion and now the, uh, the P-8 Poseidon patrol aircraft uses essentially the same kinds of sauna buoys and deployment system. So we have another question from a gentleman named Mike. He says, did the SP-5B rescue any pilots during Vietnam War? The, the uh, SP-5B uh, did serve, um, they were based out of Comron Bay in South Vietnam. Their primary mission was to um, uh, provide surveillance in Operation Market Time, which was to interdict uh, communist um, sampans and junks that were trying to smuggle arms uh, to the Viet Cong and the communist uh, North Vietnamese in the, in the South. Uh, and they did take lots of small arms fire. A lot of the airplanes came back with uh, bullet holes in them. Uh, but to my knowledge, the only, um, they didn't ever go behind uh, enemy lines at the rescue uh, that I'm familiar with, any downed airmen. That was mostly the province of the Air Force's uh, uh, Grumman Albatross uh, amphibian planes that did that, uh, did a lot of those missions. So our next question comes from Amber and she says, how many people were on board this aircraft? The crew ranged from 10 to 12. Uh, there was a pilot, a co-pilot, and a tactical action officer. Those are the three officers or flight officers on board. And then you had a crew chief, uh, you had a tail observer, you had a, a Julie Jezebel operator, uh, a MAD and uh, MAD detector and a radar operator, and then you had observers for the two waste uh, positions, and uh, then you probably had a p couple uh, backup crewmen. So generally they flew with no more than 12 or 13. So Eric says, how did it get the nickname Mighty Martin? 
Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, it was the it was the bigger. It was certainly much bigger than the PBM, its predecessor. Uh, and, and and of course, when it when it was retired from the Navy, it was not only the most modern flying boat we had, but the biggest of, with the exception of uh, the Martin Mars uh, flying boat, which was still in use up in Canada, fighting uh, fire, forest fires up until a couple of years ago. So we have a comment from Mr. Steve, and he says, "Thanks, Kim. You and I share that both our dads flew 5533." Wow. Um, my dad—I don't know that my dad flew 5533 or not, because I haven't been able to look in his in his log books to see whether the actual log time. My dad was in VP 47. Uh, this airplane, from what I've been able to glean, was uh, either in VX1 or in, ended the service in VP 40. So whether my dad actually fl uh, flew this air this particular airplane is a mystery to me. So we have a question from Roland, and he says, how far could this aircraft go on a tank of fuel? What is its range? Its range was 3,000 miles. And what was its top speed? Top speed was 269 miles per hour. Uh, its cruising speed, usually when, on, when it was on patrol, was between 130 and 145 uh, miles per hour, and that was to conserve fuel. So we've got time for one last question, and it comes from David. And he says, is this the same airplane as the Japanese PS-1? The Japanese PS-1 is a completely different design. Uh, a little background, the Shin, it's built by the Shin Meiwa uh, company in Japan. And Shin Meiwa's predecessor was Kawanishi uh, during World War II. And they built some very, uh, very good flying boats of their own, the Emily and the Mavis flying boats. When uh, Shin Meiwa, when uh, Kawanishi uh, tried to, to, when they were rebuilding Japanese economy and industry after World War II in 1949, it was reestablished as Shin Meiwa, and Shin Meiwa had the contract with the U.S. Navy to do all the maintenance on the Navy's seaplanes that were stationed in the Western Pacific. Uh, so, they, although they did maintenance on it, when they were looking for a, an airplane, new search and rescue airplane uh, for the new Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force in the uh, uh, early uh, 60s, uh, they started with a blank sheet of paper. Although when you look at the PS-1, it looks very familiar. It's got the T-tail, it's got the uh, very similar looking nose, uh, but that's where the similarity ends. It's got a, a straight wing with four turboprop engines instead of radials, and it's got two really good systems. One's called the uh, the water boundary system, what they do is around the chine where the vertical side meets the hull, they've got a, a groove that, that uh, brings water and forces water down and aft so that sea spray stays out of the engines. And then they have what's called, they've got a, actually got a, four, a fifth engine, jet engine, that does provides what they call boundary layer controls for the flaps. And it blows uh, air over the flaps and forces, actually forces the airplane into the air much faster, gives it much higher lift. It's really a short takeoff and landing airplane that can get airborne in 15-foot sea states uh, and uh, can fly as slow as 45 to 50 miles an hour, which is pretty awesome for an airplane. So they look a lot alike, but there's no, uh, they don't share anything in common. And uh, thank you very much for joining us and uh, letting us share uh, one of our uh, jewels here in the Naval Aviation, uh, National Naval Aviation Museum. Hope you'll join us next time. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Commander. Um, next week, we're going to be on the quarter deck of the museum with several of our museum representatives for a quarter deck tour. That's Thursday, June 25th at 11 a.m. Central Time. Thank you all for joining us and have a great day. That's a wrap.